good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so just to give you a brief introduction to me and why I'm here in this series. So I'm head of school in the School of Informatics at the University of Edinburgh. And we've recently started an initiative that we call AI for Social Good. And so um, as a member of the Orbit Advisory Board, I was asked if I would come and talk about this initiative. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm not actually an AI researcher myself, although I think my first paper appeared in an AI journal, but I later moved over more towards computer science and particularly formal methods and dynamic modeling. But as head of school, I'm very proud to represent the school and the work that we do. So when we think about AI, if we look at the general context at the moment, it's much more high profile than it's been at any time in the last 30 years. So we have all sorts of visions of AI being put forward, some of them quite cataclysmic. So um, visions like Terminator, which is clearly fiction, uh, Slaughterbots, which is a film that was produced by Stuart Russell, which is not so quite so clearly fiction, although it is a, a, an imaginary scenario, but it's one based on current capability of technology. And it presents a view of the world where we have small drones that can work on face recognition and carry out assassinations. I don't know if you can see there, but there is a small bullet hole in the center of the head. If you've not seen Slaughterbots, I would recommend you Google for it and have a look. And so there are these dystopian visions of how the future could be enabled by AI. At the same time, we also have academic research that shows that the AI we have at the moment is not necessarily behaving the way that we would want it to. So for example, we know that there are issues of algorithmic unfairness. And so this should give us pause before we use machine learning in scenarios where it makes a difference to people's lives. Of course, we would love it to make a positive difference, but there are cases where it could have quite a negative dis difference, like this well-known study um, about decisions about people's uh, risk of reoffending. Large corporations such as Google have been found to um, be behaving perhaps not the most ethically, and also to not perhaps have examined their own behavior as closely as they should. So there was the well-known um, problem of identifying chim chimps um, more easily than black people. And we see that the technology that AI enables, such as face recognition, can be used for quite sinister purposes. So we see an increase in the use of AI around the world by authoritarian states to monitor their um, population and try and control how they behave. So all this creates quite a negative view of what AI is and what its capabilities might be. And this has been counteracted by some, to some extent by a huge interest in data ethics and AI ethics. So we see um, many different types of organizations trying to put forward frameworks and um, initiatives to improve the ethical standards in this area. So for example, the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport um, have its own framework that was published in 2018. Alan Turing Institute understandably had um, a guide for people on um, AI ethics and safety, and they've also got working groups in this area. And companies as well, such as Microsoft, have published their principles by which they want to make AI trustworthy. So things like fairness, inclusiveness, um, etc. So that's all the background. And then sometimes we have um, politicians such as Joe Swinton, perhaps not fully understanding the issues and suggesting that we should make all AI developers swear an oath and not understanding that AI is a tool and it would be like saying every hammer manufacturer should swear an oath to make sure that uh, the hammer's not used maliciously and only used for putting in nails. But it shows a level of concern within the public 
about where AI is taking us. So that's one bit of background. And then I want to also talk a little bit about the Edinburgh context. So we are the School of Informatics. We are probably the largest grouping of AI, computer science and cognitive science researchers within the UK. Uh, we was established in 1998, bringing together the departments of artificial intelligence, computer science and cognitive science. And this is our lovely building, which at the moment is fairly empty because of the current COVID restrictions and uh, most people working from home. I was in yesterday, I think there were about 20 of us in this building. So we have a very long tradition of AI activity at Edinburgh. We were one of the first three groups in the world. Um, so the others being Stanford and MIT, so we the first AI department in the UK. Uh, the research group was set up in 1963 and we then had a department of machine intelligence and perception and the brother departments um, and they were united together to be the Department of Artificial Intelligence in 1974, but we were teaching a degree from the late 60s. Uh, at around the same time, the university had a computer unit and that became the Department of Computer Science in 1969. And again, the degree started somewhat earlier than the, the department. And then for cognitive science, we had the Center for Speech Technology and Research in 1984, which became the Department of Cognitive Science in 1985. And these were the three that were brought together to form the School of Informatics. And we're very proud of our um, breadth of studying everything from chip design to how children learn language. And we find many rich interactions to having that very broad view of the discipline. As I mentioned, we're very large. We have about 147 academic staff, about 200 research staff and a number of um, support staff of various kinds. And then our student body is made up of about 1,200 undergraduates, 400 MSc students and about 400 PhD students. So this really is a, a sort of powerhouse of activity and AI is very core to much of what goes on. It's also important to think that um, the school sits at the center of a very rich ecosystem in Edinburgh. There are a lot of startups, scale-ups and major companies all within about um, a mile of the department. And many of our students go and spend time with them. Some projects are joint with them. So we're quite a big influencer, I think, within that ecosystem. In terms of our research uh, being such a large grouping, we're split into a number of different research institutes. So there are six different research institutes and uh, I don't expect you to take them all in, but I think what I would point out is that four out of the six um, actually work on aspects of AI through some ANC looking at, actually I see that some of the labels have gone a bit wrong here. I'm sorry about this. So I'll say, I will say what they each do because um, Somebody redid the slide this morning and it's not quite right. So ANC is actually Brain and Neuroinformatics and Machine Learning. ILCC is Language, Natural Language Processing, etc. AI, AI has the right label here. It's Intelligent Planning, Proof Planning, Security, what have you. IPAB is Robotics and Vision. And um, ICSA is parallel, um, Computer Science, etc and LFCS is theory. So I'm sorry, those seem to have got swapped around. But the key message was that we have many different aspects of AI um, being actively developed within the school. More broadly in the university, there is um, wide interest in AI and data science. We have a city region deal which is based on data-driven innovation. It's an unusual city region deal that the university is actually at the center of it um, and the driver working with local government and uh, national government. And so key within that is the idea of ethics for data and AI. And we were very pleased a year ago when we um, made an offer to Shannon Valor and she agreed and she joined us in February this year 
from um, the University of Santa Cruz, but she'd also spent some time working with Google, and she came as the Bailey Gifford Chair of Ethics of Data, Science, Data and Artificial Intelligence, joining the Edinburgh Futures Institute, which is one of the institutes funded by the City Deal. I believe she spoke at the last um, seminar in this series, so I won't say too much more, uh, but she's recently set up the Centre for Technomoral Futures, so very much thinking along similar lines of what is it that um, we want from AI, how can we ensure that it's being developed wisely and to the benefit of society. So about 18 months ago, I started to think as head of this school where we had a lot of research in a, and we could see this context of, of, to some extent of fear and misgivings about the developments of AI of where did our responsibilities lie and what could we do to try and ensure that um, fears were not ill-founded so that the public actually understood what uh, AI was and wasn't capable of and what measures should be put in place to perhaps control it. But also, particularly with respect to being a large educator, as you saw, we, we have um, over 2,000 students in our care at any time. So what should we be doing um, to try and ensure that we move more towards a utopian rather than dystopian future based on AI? So there seemed to be four key elements there. One was as a large department, um, the largest in the country, we have a certain amount of influence and therefore responsibility to try and lead by example. We need to educate the next generation. So as I say, we have a large number of students in our care being trained by us at any time. So we have a real opportunity through that to um, raise their awareness and their ability to think about these issues before they go out into that ecosystem or into other academic departments. We could seek to enable others, um, making sure that AI is good for social good is um, not the domain of one school or one university. Uh, so we would seek to be working in partnership with others um, nationally and internationally to as I say, guide the future towards a more utopian rather than dystopian outcome. And we also need to inform the public because some of those things that we see arising in the press are, um, we know, somewhat science fiction or largely science fiction. And so we need to try and get the public to understand what they should be worried about, and there's plenty of that, but what they really don't need to because um, it's, we're nowhere near the level of um, development that they perhaps get the impression from Hollywood. So in order to um, undertake this programme of responsibility, we decided to set up a centre for AI for social good. And much of this is focusing existing research activity within the school, but we hope to also stimulate some new activity. So from the school's point of view, we have um, particular things of relevance here was Shannon's appointment uh, to the Bailey Gifford chair and our recent award of a biomedical AI CDT, where obviously there's great scope within the biomedical domain for AI to be used for social good. And so we kind of felt we have a certain amount of credibility to be talking about these things. What we hoped by making a very visible center was that this would create a motivation for staff and students to really engage with this issue about how AI is used. So the responsible use of AI. We thought this would create new research opportunities by bringing in collaborators who shared our vision and possibly also philanthropic donations um, from foundations or individuals who could sign up for this view of AI as something that was going to be beneficial to humanity rather than threatening its destruction. And what did we hope to send out? Well, as I've mentioned several times, we're very conscious that we train many young people, so we wanted well-informed graduates. Um, we wanted our own profile to be a bit more understandable and cohesive. And 
we envisage that there'll be research outputs, as there always has been, but now perhaps a little bit more um, joined up in how it's presented to the wider world. And through the work that we do, we would also hope to influence society and government explicitly. In the longer term, as well as having a centre, what we hoped we could do would be perhaps to launch a new MSc programme in the area of AI and social good, working closely with Shannon to bring in the philosophical and um, the technomoral issues around the use of AI so that it would be really interdisciplinary scholars being trained there. We would like to start a, a CDT programme, which I'll mention in a little bit more detail later. At the moment, the centre is only virtual, it's sort of within the School of Informatics, but within the Edinburgh Futures Institute, when it is opened, which will be in 2022 now, I think, uh, we hope that we might be able to establish a more physical centre, which would be particularly aimed at um, working. So the Edinburgh Futures Institute is largely focused towards the arts, humanities and social sciences. And obviously, if we're talking about social good, it's natural that we should try and do that in collaboration with the social sciences. And so in Edinburgh, that's the School of uh, Social and Political Sciences. And once we had a physical centre, what we would hope to do is establish a kind of visitor programme, uh, something a bit like the Newton Institute for Mathematics, which would be centred on social challenges. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So leading by example, what do we mean? Well, largely what we wanted to do was to give a platform to a lot of existing work that was going on within the school in terms of research, to be a beacon to others and also to be a beacon locally to stimulate more activity in these areas. And on this slide, you see that I list just some of the projects that we have going on at the moment. And in the following slides, I'm going to pick out uh, just three of those to speak about in more detail so that you can see some of the work that we're doing um, that can very legitimately be called AI for social good. Uh, so things I'm not going to talk about in detail, but we have been doing for a number of years is work related to um, speech vision and machine learning around speech and language th therapy. So we work with medicine to develop um, a speech bank and new techniques that allow people who've lost their voice through illness to have a voice not like the one that Stephen Hawking had, but one that's something related to their own voice and can articulate for them. Um, some more examples are on this following slides where we're working on um, things like uh, promoting citizen science is one of the examples I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, encouraging lifestyles with continuous tracking of activity and exercise, particularly aimed at people who perhaps have health problems that can be improved by better activity and exercise habits. So I picked out just three examples. Um, so one is our, our work on exoskeletons and prosthesis. This has been going on for um, probably about a decade. So Professor Setu Vijay Kumar, who some of you might know from Robo Wars, also has research in this area, working, uh, as it says, on prosthesis and also exoskeletons, such as you see the researcher here working, wearing, uh, to support people who perhaps have spinal damage and difficulty using their limbs. This can help restore movement to them. And we're very proud that recently we also appointed Kia Nazirpur, who also works on uh, prosthetics, particularly hand prosthetics for people who've lost um, their hand. So we have a lot of uh, work there and hoping to expand it further. Within the medical domain, we also have work looking at um, AI with surgery. So using AI to help surgeons for um, particular procedures such as um, prostate biopsies, but also more generally of being able to link the imaging that surgeons can see with the use of tools through robotic interfaces. 
Um, so it's, this is an example of that medical domain. I mentioned citizen science. So many um, people do engage in citizen science and certain areas of exploration um, have become quite dependent on having general public users helping in classification tasks most useful usually. So these are all sorts of things from um, identifying penguins, which was one of the first ones in Galaxy Zoo, where there are images and members of the public can uh, click on everything that they think is a penguin on the image, through to looking at um, drug formation and looking at astral data. But there's been a problem observed with um, citizen science in that people can quite easily get fatigued and just as they're becoming really useful in the sense that they've got their eye in perhaps for spotting penguins, they also lose interest and drop out. And so what one of my colleagues, Kobe Gal, who was working on, was looking at how you could incorporate machine learning into a platform like Galaxy Zoo to put in interventions at just the right point to give feedback to the volunteer, to keep them engaged and get them to continue their interaction with the platform and the valuable contribution that they make to science. And so to, um, as I say, machine learning, and personalized interventions, it was shown that participants' um, contributions increased by over 70% when they were using this enhanced version of the platform compared with the basic version of Galaxy Zoo. Another project uh, related to medicine, and as you would imagine with our biomedical AI, uh, CDT, this is an area where we, we do a lot of work uh, jointly with uh, the School of Medicine at, in Edinburgh. So this is work looking to help diagnose uh, people with bacterial infections in their lungs uh, using fibred confocal fluorescence microscopy. Uh, so people have um, a dye injected into um, their system and then what we want to do is detect where the bacteria are in the lungs and in fact whether things are bacteria or just other um, alien sort of dust or whatever in the lungs. And so Sohan Seth who is one of our data scientists in the school worked um, using neural networks to predict in an image whether bacteria are present or not. So it actually works on a pixel by pixel basis to determine which of these bright spots that we see on the image here, so this typical image that comes out of the microscopy to determine whether that is a bacterium. And once you can get that, you can work out um, the likely diagnosis for the um, patient and the best treatment uh, for their lung disease. So that's us really collating our existing research and looking for opportunities to develop new and um, stimulating uh, PhD students, for example, to see that there are these opportunities to apply AI towards um, beneficial outcomes for the public and society generally. But we also do a lot of training that's more teaching based, and so we want to bring our influence to bear within that field as well. So we feel it's really important to educate the students right from the first year of their undergraduate degree on uh, taking a responsible view to their discipline. They are professionals and they need to be able to talk and reason about these issues. So we integrate ethical issues into, for example, our professional issues course, which the students currently take in third year. But it's not enough to do that. Uh, we think it's really important, not just that they learn this as an academic subject, but they really get comfortable with the idea of talking about these issues and reasoning about them. Um, understanding that there's not always a single answer or a clear um, solution to, to the ethical dilemmas that are perhaps presented. And so we want to equip them with the thought process and 
experiences and vocabulary so that they can use this throughout their future careers to possibly challenge if an employer asks them to do something that they consider inappropriate or unscrupulous. So we are developing a specialist course on AI and ethics, excuse me. which will be offered to final year students. But we've also revised all our compulsory first and second year courses so that they have elements of social responsibility and ethics within them. So we didn't like the model that perhaps students got all their technical knowledge and then just got ethics as a, an add-on at the end if they chose to take that option in their final year. So instead, they all get some element of this woven into the subjects as they learn them. And we've been working um, closely with Shannon to look at how we, we do that and where the appropriate interventions are. So I'll give you just one example. We've this year introduced a new course called Foundations of Data Science. This is compulsory for all second years, and this is on all our degrees, computer science, AI and cognitive science. Um, and it includes a variety of different modes of delivery. So we have lectures, there are some videos, and in particular, the students partake in, in workshops. And within this course, there was a specific aim that the students should become aware of ethical challenges that are inherent in data science, that the data science technology is itself not neutral, um, it does reflect biases that will exist in the data. So it's very important to be conscious of that. And also that there's not simple solutions to this. The challenges are difficult. And so it's not just a case of saying this is the right way of doing it and this is the wrong. There are quite often different stakeholders involved whose needs need to be balanced and come to the best solution, which may not be um, optimal for each individual, but is the best collectively. So we encourage the students through workshops to engage um, in case studies and develop their um, ability and willingness to talk about these issues and reason them through, because we believe this will be essential for their future careers, whether that be in academia or in industry. And the case studies that are taken are quite often based on real cases. So recently, for example, the students were looking at the case where Facebook was um, essentially experimenting on its users by showing them different types of news. So some more positive, some more negative, and then looking at how they reported their mood without the consent of the users to be used in that way in an experiment. So we have the students understand what the case was, why there was an issue, and then talk about it themselves. A big part of how our students learn is their projects. So our third year students undertake a system design project, which has always been based on robotics. And a couple of years ago, we decided to change that from robot football, which was a lot of fun, um, but was a rather isolated case and also perhaps a little boyish. Um, to having the students instead design assistive robots. Now we do let them choose for themselves what counts as assistive and every year we do get one or two cocktail delivering robots, but the majority of the students look towards um, assistive uh, perhaps more generally in society and we've had a number of robots that have been designed for working for delivering medicines in chilled cabinets around hospitals, um, drug dispensing robots, and also one of my favourites was a robot that the students designed that could open bottles and pour out medicine for people who perhaps had arthritic hands and couldn't manage that for themselves. So in changing from football to assistive robots, we also made another change, which was that as well as having a mentor to help the students manage their group, they're in quite large groups doing this, there's about 10 of them. Um, and so they have a design sprint and then an implementation period. And they have a mentor to help them manage that and give them some technical advice. We also now assign each group a client 
who is particularly intended to challenge them to think about the needs of the person they're designing for, rather than them develop the idea that they can just design it as they think best without perhaps consulting other people. It's not practical for us always to be able to give them access to real clients, but we have PhD students who um, play that role for them and challenge them as they develop. And then we have all our undergraduates and MSc students as elsewhere must do an individual project or a group project and written up as a dissertation. And these are proposed as ideas to the students in January each year. And from last year, we've been tagging some of those as AI for social good. And the evidence from last year suggests that many students are strongly altruistic and we're really drawn towards the projects that were tagged in that way. So we're gonna continue doing that. And supervisors of such projects are encouraged to have conversations with the students about how this is AI for social good and what considerations need to be brought in to make sure that that is um, what's going to be the outcome. In terms of our postgraduate training, we have a large number of PhD students. We have six CDTs. Um, so ranging from data science, as you can see, through to cybersecurity and trust. And all our CDTs incorporate training in responsible research and innovation. Um, but this is particularly emphasised within the CDT for biomedical AI. And I see that my colleague Ian Simpson is here. So if anyone has any questions about that, they can ask him. So he directs that CDT. Um, and the training for there was developed in collaboration with Robin Williams of the Institute for Study of Science, Technology and Innovation and the School of Social and Political Science. Um, and we feel it's very important that we don't just, as technical people, theoretical people um, working on AI, with very good understanding of the technology and the research that we want to bring into play for social good, we should also accept that what we understand to be social good is perhaps limited and talk to specialists such as colleagues like um, Robin uh, about what really constitutes social good and how do we judge that. So that brings us on to the vision that we have for a future CDT or DTC, which would be a, a, a study for a cohort of students particularly looking at AI for social good, where the um, issue of their PhD would be both the AI methodologies that they would develop, but also um, a deeper understanding of how they can achieve the outcomes that they desire in the context in which it's applied. So this would help to counteract that media presentation as AI is either utopian or dystopian. It's much more nuanced than that. And, um, would build on the interest in AI ethics. But in order to bring out genuine social good, there must be genuine attention on the ethical outcomes, not just the wishfulness of the um, technical researchers as sometimes happens. So the idea is to develop this DTC jointly with the School of Social and Political Sciences so that we can give students a grounding in techniques that will um, allow them to not only plan for responsible research and innovation, but also interrogate the outcomes to assess how well they have actually achieved what they hope to achieve in context. And the particular areas that we're discussing with um, SPS are international development, where they believe there's great scope for working with um, the strong team that we have in the University of Edinburgh, working in international development, both in Asia and in Africa, uh, to bring in artificial intelligence in a number of different forms. Uh, so you might have noticed in the list of research um, topics, I think I had one, which is looking at um, using computer vision to understand um, the aftermath of storms, for example, in, in countries by using computer vision to spot the roofs of buildings, so whether they've been blown off or not. Uh, another area is social inclusion, uh, because AI can be seen to um, accelerate 
social division by excluding certain people. So we think it would be very good to look at how AI can instead be used to bring in greater social inclusion and also sustainability. Um, as we look at, uh, for example, zero carbon challenges that are being posed nationally and locally and within the university itself, we have a target. How can we use AI technology to help achieve those aims? So we also wanted to enable others, and this is the idea that within the Edinburgh Futures Institute, we would like the Centre for AI for Social Good to have a, a presence that could be then used to host a visitors programme, allowing researchers from around the world, particularly those working in AI, but also those looking at the social aspects, um, to come together in a series of programmes. So for those that don't know, the Newton Institute is um, based in Cambridge, and run by the Inter International Centre for Mathematical Sciences. And each uh, six months picks a topic and invites international researchers to come and work together to tackle um, a problem around that topic. And people can come for a short period of a week or two, and some people will come for three months at a time to really work intensively towards a common goal. So this is what we would like to have in the area of AI for social good and picking our themes related to the UN sustainability goals. So for example, um, based on the idea of sustainability, we could have a six month program around climate action, or we might look at um, a program around clean water and sanitation and how AI might be used for that and so on. However, this is the kind of thing that will involve a lot of investment to pay for um, being able to enable people to come. So there's um, a similar program around computer science at the Simons Foundation in Berkeley, but that has a very generous donation um, supporter in the Simons Foundation. Uh, so we are still looking for such a generous um, supporter for this program, but I, I live in hope. Everyone that knows me knows I'm an optimist. Informing the public. So, it is true that we need to be careful and we have responsibility about AI, uh, but we also need to try and guard against some of the more extreme visions of AI that we see being portrayed, not just in fiction, but in newspapers quite often and uh, perhaps in the mainstream media. So we try to counteract this through surfacing the work that we do. As I say, we already have a lot of activity that's going on. We realised it was very diffuse within our different institutes and perhaps not visible for people looking at our web pages. So we're working to bring that together under the centre so it has greater visibility. We also want to get out more broadly than just researchers and the people who might look at our web pages. And our students have actually been leading the way with this, that they started last year a series of public discussions under the title of We Need to Talk About AI. And they picked um, topics such as autonomous cars. Um, I think they had one around the Slaughterbot film and the idea of weaponizing um, face recognition combined with uh, drones and how that could be. And they have people propose in favor of the topic and against, so it's a classical dis debate. And then they um, assess, let the public um, join in. Now, so far, this has been public in the sense that it's been advertised within the university and attracted students and staff from a wide variety of different schools, but we haven't really gone out to the public, general public yet. Uh, in the future, we hope to do that, but at the moment, public outreach is somewhat on hold because of COVID, partly because we can't gather, but also because uh, many staff are, are working flat out on um, teaching online and the extra demands that COVID has placed upon us. So to summarize, um, this is the idea behind our Centre for AI for Social Good. We've got started, we're by no means finished yet. We hope to bring in a lot more activity and raise, raise the profile further. Um, and I have, hope you found it interesting to hear a little bit about that. I'd be interested to hear your responses. Uh, but that's the end of my talk. Thank you.